Again, I would like to thank those of you that are tuning in, uh, those that have tuned in on uh, multiple occasions, have enjoyed uh, the messages. Uh, we are located in Wilton, New Hampshire, Good News Bible Church on 27 Hutchinson Road. And we meet at 10 a.m. on Sundays. And we would love to have you come visit. If you do not have a church home, uh, please come and visit us and be blessed. Thank you. So I'm going to take the words to the song that we just did, Chain Breaker, by Zach Williams. I'm going to parallel them uh, to some individuals in the, in the Bible. And this song, it touches on so many biblical truths in a way that we can identify with. Though our circumstances are not going to be exactly like the people that we're going to see uh, within the scriptures, our emotional reactions sometimes to the circumstances that we go through are very universal. You see, every, every one of us understands that we're born into a fallen world and that we have a sinful nature. We're both physical beings. We're both spiritual beings. And, and you know, we're born into sin. We have this sinful nature. We've inherited it. And uh, there are lifestyles that come with it. And there are ways in which we've listened to the lies and how we need to stop listening and let the chain breaker set us free. Now, just so you'll understand this spiritual entity that we fight against in this war that we're in, Revelation 12, 7 and 9 says, And there was war in heaven. Michael and his angels fought against the dragon, and the dragon and his angels fought back, but he was not strong enough. And they lost their place in heaven. They lost their place in heaven, which means these were heavenly beings at one point, beings that worship uh, God. And now pride has set in. They believe the lies of Lucifer. Uh, and now they've, they've battled for the throne of God. And it says the great dragon, Satan, was hurled down. That ancient serpent called the devil or Satan, who leads the world astray. That's his one goal to lead the world astray. He was hurled to the earth and his angels with him. So in, in the spiritual realm, if God can open up our eyes and we could see what's going on in different places, it would be Stephen King movie on steroids. And we probably would freak out and say, no, I don't want to see this. But we live in a fallen world. We're both physical and we're spiritual beings. Matthew 13, 37 and 39 says, the one who sowed the good seeds is the Son of Man, Christ. The field is the world, and the good seed stands for, for the sons of the kingdom. The weeds are the sons of the evil one. The sons of the evil one. So think of this. There are people that are under the influence of Satan. They're sons of the evil one. And the enemy who sows them is the devil. And the harvest in the end of the age and the harvesters are the angels. He was talking about a, a, a guy that went out and sowed, but weeds grew up because somebody had come and threw seeds and weeds into the, uh, into the field. So we're living with, pe with people that do not understand that they are under the influence of the evil one. Just as we sang earlier that we want to be under the influence of God. We want to experience that fire, that presence that, that washes away our fear. Just as we become under the influence of the Father, people become outside of Christ under the influence of the enemy. Listen to this. That the field is the world warns against applying this parable too quickly to the institution of the church. Sons of, the word sons of again appears in the sense of people who belong to something. To something. Ownership. Lordship. Wow. Listen to this. 2 Corinthians 4, 3 and 4. If the good news we preach is hidden behind a veil, it is hidden only from people who are perishing. Satan, who is the God of this world, has blinded the minds of those who don't believe. Hence the battle that we are in. Hence all the lies that are being believed. 
They're unable to see the glorious light of the good news. They don't understand this message about the glory of Christ, who is the exact likeness of God. Furthermore, one of the greatest tools Satan uses is lies. It's lies. All out 100% lies. He mixes them with a little bit of truth, though. And it is the lies that people believe that keep them trapped into captivity to do the will of the Father. And until someone comes in and speaks truth, people are going to be still stay in the realm of lies. Here's Jesus. And he's, <laughs> he's speaking to some religious leaders. Just keep this in mind. He's speaking to religious leaders. He says to them, if you were Abraham's children, said Jesus, then you would do the things Abraham did. As it is, you are determined to kill me. A man who has told you the truth that I heard from God. Abraham did not do such things. You are doing the things your own father does. We are not illegitimate children, they, they protested. The only father we have is God himself. Then Jesus said to them, If God were your father, you would love me, for I came down from God and now am here. I have not come on my own, but he sent me. Why is my language not clear to you? Because you are, un you are unable to hear what I say. And then he says this, You belong to your father, the devil, and you want to carry out your father's desire. He was a murderer from the beginning, not holding to the truth, for there is no truth in him. When he lies, he speaks his native language, for he is a liar and the father of lies. And he's, Jesus is telling these people, that's your dad. That's who you're following. That must have been arresting. Either that or, you know, either they, they said, are we really deceived? Do you think they, they just sat down and, and contemplated that? No, they got even more angry and wanted to, to, to kill Christ. Scripture makes it clear that the devil is the father of lie. Peter, Peter says he, he, he roams about looking for those that he may devour. And that we're told to be, you know, be ready, to be sharp, to be prepared. So I want to bring your attention back to this song, the opening verses of this song, because they capture uh, what many people either have or are presently experiencing in their life. And the song goes out like this. Now, if you've ever seen the video, Zach used to be a prisoner. And he goes back to one of the prisons, and, he, and he's got a band with him, uh, Zach Williams here. And, and he sings this song. A bunch of prisoners come in. It's pretty powerful. They come in, and you're wondering, what's, what's going on? They're all dressed in their prison garb, but it, it's a concert. And they're all, all the prisoners are singing this song exact as Zach plays. And he says this, if, if you've been walking the same old road for miles and miles... And if you've been hearing the same old voice, tell the same old lies. He's speaking and they're, they're singing as he sings. And they're understanding exactly what he's talking about. Because every one of them is in a prison because they listen to the lies of the enemy. The promises of the enemy that fed their sinful nature and they did things that landed them in jail. I want you to picture this. You don't have to be a physical criminal to be in a prison. Every one of us in this room, if our flesh reigns supreme and, and we listen to the lies of the enemy, we become prisoners. Prisoners sometimes of our own making. Whenever we lend our ear to the devil or his angels, they lead our heart. Remember, the heart is the seat of the will, the mind, the intellect. Those lies then become beliefs. We trade the truth of God for a lie. We begin to, to, to believe the lies of the enemy. God doesn't love you. Uh, this is okay to do. There's always pleasure behind it. There's always this promise of pleasure for sin. He peddled the lies in heaven. He peddles them here. 
And outside of Christ, people believe so many lies, especially about God, about truth, about wrong and right. Jesus replied, I tell you the truth, everyone who sins is a slave to sin. A slave. Everyone who sins is a slave to sin. Now a slave has no permanent place in the family, but a son belongs to it forever. So if the son sets you free, you will be free indeed. I know you are Abraham's descendants, yet you are ready to kill me because you have no room for my word. Isn't that powerful? No room for my word. You're just, you're, you're full of lies. You're full of believing the one that tells the lies. You're under his leadership. He's your Lord. And you have no room for my word. You see why the, the Bible is so important? Because when, pe when people don't have it to stand on as a foundation, then all they have is the world, the devil in their flesh. I am telling you what I have seen in the Father's presence, and you, do, and you do what you have heard from your Father. Wow, you have no room for my word in your heart. That's a powerful thing to tell, tell somebody, but it's a reality. So instead of listening to truth, people walk away. And, and, and they listen to the lies, and they're full of deception. The lies of power or, or materialism or pleasure. And there's always a trade-off. Always. Listen, he, he goes on in his song. If you're trying to fill the same old holes inside, there's a better life. There's a better life. And see, everything that we need is in our Father's house. The story of the prodigal, what did he want? He wanted his inheritance, and he wanted to go and spend it and do what he wanted to do. Everything he needed was in his father's house. Worth, acceptance, love, provision. And no, he takes his inheritance, he goes out, he squanders everything, and until he realized where he was, he still had holes in his heart. You know, we're made with this, this spiritual hole within our being that only God can fill. And I know you've heard this before, and some of you maybe this is the first time you're hearing it. But God made us, Solomon said in Ecclesiastes, and he put eternity in our hearts. Eternity. There's that longing that we know there's more to this life than what we're experiencing. And so what we do outside of Christ is we feel that need for something. We're going to worship something. So what do we do? We fill it. I did in my teen years with music and drugs and partying. That's how I filled this gaping hole that I knew there was a struggle. I knew there was something more. I just couldn't put my finger on it until God opened my eyes. And I stopped filling the holes with the world, the flesh, and the devil, and started filling them with the Bible and worship and fellowship. And things began to change. You see, number one on your outline, that's just my intro. My am, we're going to be here for a while. Every person needs their eyes and ears opened to the knowledge of truth found in Jesus to set them free from the lies of the enemy. Every person needs their eyes and ears open, their hearts open to the knowledge of truth found in Jesus to set them free from the lies of the enemy. 2 Timothy 2, 25, 26, those who oppose them, he must gently instruct in the hope that God will grant them repentance leading to the knowledge of the truth and that they will come to their senses and escape from the trap of the devil who has taken them captive to do his will. Picture that prodigal son, and he's, he's, he's feeding pigs. And he's so hungry, he's just longing to eat the slop that he's feeding the pigs. And he's realizing, i got all these holes inside. I believe the lies about the world and, and I, the knowledge of the Father. He came to his senses. 
He came to his senses. There's a better life. Not just a better life, it's the only life worth living. And, and life outside uh, uh, of living in the truth of Jesus Christ is a lie. It is a lie. We're told, finally be strong in the Lord and in his mighty power. Put on the full armor of God so that you can take your stand against the devil's schemes. He, he's a liar, so he's got schemes. You ever have a scheme that you pull off? No one's going to raise a hand on this one. <laughs> so I ain't saying nothing. My hand, stay down. Yeah. Schemers. Yeah. And he's the biggest one. For our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the powers of this dark world, and against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly realms. You see, when Satan lost his place in heaven and the angels with him, some say a third of the angels, where are they now? They're, they are entities that rule cities, that influence leaders. I've seen the evidence of false worship at concerts. People just so into, you know, I'll never forget Black Sabbath at the Boston Garden in 75, doing Dark Side of the Moon. I, I, I was a brand new Christian, and I'm looking around at everyone, and I realized, wow, I had been to a couple of Bible studies and some worship services where we worship God, and I realized they're worshiping the music and the band, and there's a spirit here of deception. And I know people listening to this right now, and, and probably some of you going, Peter, that's going too far. No, 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 no. Music is powerful and how we use it is powerful how we use it is powerful therefore we're told to put on the full arm of god so that when the day of evil comes you may be able to stand your ground in other words <laughs> you're in a battle whether you want to be or not, you're in this battle. And you need to stand your ground. And after you've done, uh, done everything to stand, you stand firm with the belt of truth, the breastplate of righteousness, feet fitted with the readiness that comes from the gospel of peace, the shield of faith, which can extinguish all the flaming arrows of the evil one, the helmet of salvation, the sword of the spirit, the word of God, prayer. Uh, this is an, an unspoken spiritual truth within these verses that many people don't seem to grasp. So in life, they begin to make choices based off of feeling and based off of the lies of the enemy. You see, letter A on your outline, as a believer, you must never take off the full armor of God because Satan will never quit trying to recapture and enslave you with his lies. As a believer, you must never take off the full armor of God because Satan will never quit trying to recapture and enslave you with his lies. Neil Anderson states the following, Before we received Christ, we were slaves to sin. Now, because of Christ's work on the cross, sin's power over us has been broken. Satan has no right of ownership or authority over us. He is, de he is a defeated foe, but he is still committed to keeping us from realizing that. The father of lies can block your effectiveness as a Christian if he can deceive you into believing that you are nothing but a product of your past subject to sin, prone to failure and controlled by your habits. It's pretty powerful. But here's the thing you've got to remember as a believer. Letter B right here. Satan has no power over you unless you believe his lies. He has no power over you unless you believe his lies. Another thing to consider on what believers and some Christians have in common right here, number two, is there is always some form of pain associated with listening and believing the lies of the enemy. There's always a form of pain. 
you just look at those that I mean, I grew up with 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 cigarette ads. Remember that? Remember the Marlboro Man? Remember that that guy? You know, hey, you, you want to be cool? You smoke a cigarette? You ride a horse? You know, you got the cowboy hat? You know, and there, there was always this appeal. Or or remember the the hard liquor ads? And they still have them, but not not as much. They went from banning that to doing beer. But what they need to do is show show some of the car accidents, show some of the people standing around mourning because they lost a son or a daughter to someone that decided to get drunk at a party and drive a two thousand pound car. See, we we we're so prone to believe, oh, just catch a buzz. And, or just smoke a cigarette. You know, I have buried two people that I watched die of lung cancer, and that is a horrible thing. Horrible thing. But oh, you'll look cool. Oh, this feels good. And then the addictions come or the cancer comes. But it's not just that, it's just it's food. A few years ago, about 10 years ago, I was 240 and had a 46 inch waist. You know why? I was an undisciplined guy and I ate a lot of food, especially chocolate. I, I dropped 40 pounds in eight months and I made a declaration. Some of you remember that when I, I was 51 years old and I made myself accountable to the whole church. I said, I'm going to lose 40 pounds. It was February 1st. See, food. You know, there's, you know, there's pleasure in food. There's no doubt about it. But man, you start packing the pounds on and that can, that can affect you, can affect your health. That one little pill, it's going to give you that release can become a habit. Looking at things you shouldn't be looking at can become a habit. I've known people that, I mean, they, they, they max out their credit cards because of materialism. I've known people that have lost their homes because of a gambling addiction. And the list goes on and on. And we believe the lies. Now, I know for some people there's, a, there's you know, chemical imbalances and all. And we got to know the difference between that and just listening to the lies of the enemy. But most of the time, listen to this, there is no inner conflict which is not psychological because there is never a time when your mind, emotions, and will will not be involved. They're always going to be involved. And there is no problem which is not spiritual. There is no time in which God is not present. So we're in, a, we're in this physical and this spiritual war. And because there is no time in which God is not present, then at all times God is with us. Even when we end up like the prodigal son, God is with us. Even in that pig slop, God is with us. He'll chase us down. But we lose so much time and lose so much ground. This is a great example. We studied this a couple years ago. And uh, this is an amazing book, the book of Ruth. But it says here, in the days when the judges ruled, there was a famine in the land. And a man from Bethlehem and Judah, together with his wife and two sons, went to live for a while in the country of Moab. Now, Moab was, was a, a very sinful, full of false gods, full of false worship. So th this man, Elimelech, and his wife, Naomi, they take their two sons, Milon and Kilon, and, and, and they... they they go to Moab, and you never see where Elimelech prayed at all. It's just they made a decision. Hey, there's food there. There's not food here. You know, there's worship here for God, but there's false worship here. But, you know, let's, we need to go. And we never see in Scripture where there was any prayer, any, any fasting at all. They just, they left. And they settle in the land, and the two sons marry uh, Moabite women. And then all of a sudden... Naomi's husband dies and her two son-in-laws die. And we're not told why and how. But she's left in a place and she now wants to go home. 
she hears after years she hears that God is blessing the land again and they have food and so she wants to go home now this is where this gets very very interesting When she heard in Moab that the Lord had come to the aid of his people by providing food for them, Naomi and her daughters-in-law prepared to return home from there. With her two daughters-in-law, she left the place where she had been living and set out on the road that would take them back to the land of Judah. Now what takes place next is that Naomi tries to talk her daughter-in-laws into staying, not going with her into staying and they were persistent in going with her to Bethlehem now here's the thing letter a Naomi's persistence in persuading right her persu persistence in persuading masked over the extreme pain that she was experiencing you got to remember she lost her husband and her two sons and she's in a lot of pain right now and She's blaming God at this point. It says, Then Naomi said to her two daughter-in-laws, Go back, each of you, to your mother's home. And may the Lord show kindness to you as you have shown to your dead and to me. And may, may the Lord grant that each of you will find rest in the home of another husband. And then she kissed them and they wept aloud and, she, and, and said to her, We will go back with you to your people. But Naomi said, return home, my daughters. Why would you come with me? Am I going to have more sons who could become your husbands? Return home, my daughters. I am too old to have another husband. Even if I thought that there was still hope for me, even if I had a husband tonight that gave birth to my sons, would you wait until they grew up? Would you remain unmarried for them? She's saying, no, you just stay here. Now think of this. Go deep here. What's in Moab? False worship, false gods. A, a, a lifestyle that people are living that is it's evil and and she knows what Bethlehem's about but she's telling her daughter-in-laws stay here you just stay stay where it's dark stay where there's false religion what in the world's going on what's happened to her heart and then they weep, weep again but then Orpah Kissed her mother-in-law goodbye, but Ruth clung to her. So one daughter-in-law, she gives up and goes back home, but Ruth's not going home. Something happened to Ruth when her husband entered her life. She must have heard about the God of Israel. She must have heard about the God of the Israelites. Her husband must have told her things that, and all of a sudden she's believing in a God she's never seen. She's believing in a people that she feels have to be in a much better spiritual place than we are. She wants out and she wants in and she's clinging. And what's her mother-in-law doing? Wow. You see, Naomi's pain turned to bitterness towards the Lord and it skewed her judgment as she sent her daughters back to live in a land that was full of idolatry. You see, what's going on in, in Naomi's heart is that you know, somehow she's believing that God's not good anymore. Look, said Naomi, your sister-in-law is going back to her people and her gods. Can you imagine that? And she's okay with saying that? She's going back to her people and her gods. Go back with her. But praise God for Ruth. She replied, don't urge me to leave you or to turn back from you. Where, where you go, I will go. And where you stay, I will stay. Your people will be my people and your God will be my God. That's a statement of faith. That's amazing. Because you're talking, that's a pagan girl that grew up in a pagan world. And all she did was hear about this God. Hasn't even experienced them yet. But she knows it's got to be, she's not listening to the lies of Moab anymore or her culture. She wants in. She wants to go to Bethlehem. Your God will be my God. 
Where you die, I will die, and, and there I will be buried. And may the Lord deal with me, be it ever so severely, if anything but death separates you and me. That's, there's no way Naomi's going. I mean, uh, Ruth is going back to Moab. It says, when Naomi realized that Ruth was determined to go with her, she stopped urging her. And that, it's, a, it's so sad that she would even urge her not to go. You see, let her be. It is when we are experiencing pain that we are more susceptible to, I'm sorry, susceptible to believe in the lies of the enemy and blame God for our situations. To blame God for our situations. In, in verse 13b of chapter 1 of Ruth, she says, No, my daughters, it is more bitter for me than for you because the Lord's hand has gone out against me. This is what she believed. And when things go bad, sometimes it's not even our fault. Sometimes it's just a diagnosis. Sometimes it's somebody else. But there are times when the enemy throws it in our mind that we deserve to be in the place we're at. Have you ever battled God? Battled the enemy, not battled God, but battled the enemy? When he comes in like at three in the morning and starts judging you, you know why your prayer's not answered? Yeah, God doesn't really love you. He's not a really good, good God like you sing. Besides, you deserve this because of this, this. And he starts, he starts accusing us all over again for the very things that we've been forgiven. But we believe his lies. She's believing the lies. Watch what takes place. So the two women went on until they came to Bethlehem. When they arrived in Bethlehem, the whole town was stirred because of them. And, and the woman exclaimed, can this be Naomi? Now watch Naomi. Don't call me Naomi, she told them. Call me Mara, because the Almighty has made my life very bitter. I went away full, but the Lord has brought me back empty. Why call me Naomi? The Lord has afflicted me. The Almighty has brought misfortune upon me. The name Naomi means sweetness and joy, pleasantness, beautiful, agreeable. She doesn't want that name anymore. She wants to be called Mara, which means bitter and poisoned. And why does she want to be called that? Because that's her heart right now towards God, and she's believed the lies. She became bitter about her circumstances. Can I ask you something? Have you ever become bitter because of your circumstances? Yeah, that's human nature. Let's go a little deeper. Have you ever blamed God? A couple of heads are shaking, yes. The rest of you are going, I would never do that. Have you ever blamed your mom or dad or your children or the boss or the neighbor or somebody else? It's got to be the government. It's got to be, you know, we, we blame, we blame when we're hurt. Number three, I love this. In all that pain, we serve a God who is a pain taker. Just like the song says, a God who is a pain taker taker so what takes place it says now Naomi had a relative on her husband's side from the clan of Elimelech a man of standing whose name was Boaz and Ruth the Moabitess said to Naomi let me go to the fields and pick up the leftover grain behind anyone in, in whose eyes I find favor and so Naomi said to her go ahead my daughter so she went out and began to glean in the fields behind the harvesters. So, you know, they're, they're cutting all the grain and, and some, of the some of the grain's falling. Uh, the, the sheaves are left over. And so you had the poor people and they would come up and, and just pick up what was left over. And that's what she was doing. And it turned out she found herself working in a field belonging to Boaz, who was from the clan of Elimelech. He was a relative. So just then, Boaz arrived from Bethlehem and greeted the harvesters. The Lord be with you. The Lord bless you. They called back. Boaz asked the foreman of the harvesters, whose young woman is that? 
The foreman replied, she's a Moabitess who came back from Moab with Naomi. And she said, please let me glean and gather among the sheaves behind the harvesters. And she went into the field and has worked steadily from morning till now, except for a short rest in the shelter. Wow. So Boaz says to Ruth, my daughter, listen to me. Don't go and glean in, the, in another field and don't go away from here. Stay here with my servant girls. Watch the field where the men are harvesting and follow along after the girls. I have told the men not to touch you. In other words, you stay away, don't harass this woman. And whatever, whenever you're thirsty, go and drink from the water jars that men have filled. In other words, his, he, he, his eyes are on this girl. And he hears about, you know, she's a mobile and she's come here and she's helping out her mother-in-law. She didn't stay home. Wow, this is amazing. And he's probably attracted. There's, there's probably an attraction there. And he's going to take care of her. And this is a God thing. At this, she bowed down with her face to the ground and she exclaimed, why have I found such favor in your eyes that you noticed me, a foreigner? And Boaz replied, I've been told all about what you have done for your mother-in-law since the death of your husband, how you left your father and mother in your homeland and came to live with a people you did not know before. May the Lord repay you for what you have done. May you be richly rewarded by the Lord, the God of Israel, under whose wings you have come to take refuge. What's he seeing? He's seeing a woman of faith, real faith. Um, let me just remind you, Ruth is experiencing a ton of pain like Naomi. She lost her husband. She lost her brother-in-law. She lost her father-in-law. She's in just as much pain. Now she left her family, her home, and by faith goes to a place she only hears about. And she, she put her faith in God and refused to believe God was anything but good. Isn't that kind of crazy? Same experiences, Ruth and Naomi, and yet this pagan woman is believing in the goodness of God where Naomi is not. Totally different attitudes, but same circumstances. You see, what you believe about God's goodness disarms the lies of the enemy. What you believe about God's goodness will disarm the lies of the enemy. Can you imagine when Satan came to Eve and, and he said, hey, God knows the day you eat this fruit, you're going to be like him. Knowing everything. He's holding out on you. you. You won't surely die. Can you imagine if she said, oh, no, I believe in the word of God. And he said, we'll die. Don't quite understand what that means, but no. She would have disarmed the lies of the enemy, but she didn't. How many times do we not trust God because of our circumstances? When God is in the midst of our circumstances. You see, number four, Ruth believed in faith that God was a way maker. A pain taker and a way maker. Isaiah 43 says, remember not the former things, nor consider the things of old. Behold, I am doing a new thing. Now it springs forth. Do, do you not perceive it? I will make a way in the wilderness and rivers in the desert. So what's Ruth say? She goes, may I continue to find favor in your eyes, my Lord? She, you have given me comfort and have spoken kindly to your servant, though I do not have the standing of one of your servant girls. So she, she's given a bunch of grain. She comes home and she starts telling Naomi, you know, where she gleaned. And when she mentioned Boaz's name, Naomi goes, whoa, wow. He has not stopped showing his kindness to the living and the dead, she added. This man is our close relative. He is one of our kinsmen redeemers. If anyone could restore Naomi back to where she was with her home and her land that her husband owned, it would be this relative. And God just put things together. I know most of you know the story. And it ends in such a beautiful way. 
Let me ask you this, though. The Lord uses those he has, he has that, that have been, uh, how do I put this? You see, eventually Boaz and Ruth fall in love and they get married and they, and they, they have a son. Let me ask you this. Who taught Boaz to be kind? Ever wonder about that? This man that she married, he was kind. And the Bible talks about his kindness. And he, and he loved his workers and he worked with them and they respected him. Who? And then he takes notice of her, of Ruth. And Who taught Boaz to be kind? Who raised Boaz to be a man with a good name and whom his workers would praise him and the people would honor him? Who had such an influence on him that he would extend grace to a Moabite woman, a foreigner, and a widow? And who taught him to be a gentleman, a protector, a provider, a promoter? Both his father and his mother. Catch this now. Salmon and Rahab. Rahab who? The prostitute. Where, where, where did she come from? Jericho. And she hid two spies. And what did she say to the spies? I have heard of your God. And everyone's scared. I want to know your God. I want deliverance. When you come and take this city, and she says, and I know you will because your God is with you, remember me. And they said, what did they say? Tie that scarlet cord so that we'll, we'll know. Because her home, her room was on the outside edge of the walls of Jericho. Who was spared? Rahab. And everyone she could pack into her room, her house. She raised Boaz. Those that have been forgiven much, love much. Rahab loved much because she had been forgiven so much. And she raises this man to be, wow, quite the guy. And his mom was one that lived in shame and guilt Notice that the grace of God extended through Joshua, who took away Rahab's pain. And that experience was, was passed on to her son, Boaz, who, who in turn extended grace and became a pain taker in the life of Ruth. The pain taking grace of Boaz transformed Ruth's situation and Ruth's testimony became Naomi's transformation. And he goes on, Boaz goes on, and he marries her. <laughs> Pretty amazing story. And they go on to have a son, and Obed, who has a son, Jesse, who has a son, David. What a story of grace. What a pain taker we serve. What a way maker we serve. And as we said last week, remember when David wanted to hide his, his, his family? Where did he go? Where it all started, he went to the king of Moab and said, can my family stay, lay, stay here? Will you protect them until things are made right and I'm made king? Wow. Wow. God was a pain taker for Rahab, a pain taker for Ruth. They both fell in love with Israelite men, planned their weddings, were grafted into the covenant promises of God, are listed in the genealogy of Jesus. And a legacy of grace continues through the person of Jesus Christ, who was our pain taker and our kinsman redeemer. Listen to this, Titus 2.14, who gave himself for us to redeem us from all wickedness and to purify for himself a people that are his very own. 
He chose us in him before the creation of the world to be holy and blameless in his sight. In love, he predestined us to be adopted as his sons through Jesus Christ in accordance with his pleasure and will to the praise of his glorious grace, which he has freely given us in the one he loves. In him, we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sins in accordance with the riches of God's grace that he lavished on us with all wisdom and understanding. If you need freedom or saving, he's a prison-shaking savior. If you've got chains, he's the chain breaker. We've all searched for the light of day in the dead of night. We all found ourselves worn out from the same old fight. When we've all run to things we know ain't right, there's a better life. There's a better life. If you believe it, if you receive it, if you can feel it, somebody testify. Testify. Do you understand that song now? Because a lot of people that have been the Ruths and the Rahabs understand it. All of us in this room understand it or should understand it. Yeah. We serve a pain taker because he took on pain for us.